We're coming to the end of the London Chess Classic and the tournament is really hotting up. With two rounds to go, there were two leaders, Jan Nipomnishi and Fabiano Caruana. Nipomnishi had a tough battle against Magnus Carlsen. Carlsen had just scored his first win of the tournament, so just he was just behind the leaders. So this is my game of the day from round eight. Carlsen actually doesn't have a fantastic record against Nipomnishi. Uh, they've known each other for years. Nipomnishi has actually helped him with uh, some training or uh, analysis, some seconding in the past. So they know each other very well. They're of the same generation, the 1990 generation, and they even, you know, they played junior tournaments together. But um, Nipomnishi actually defeated him in the Tata Steel Tournament of 2011, I believe. Um, I mean, some time ago, but it just shows in classical chess, Carlsen has never beaten Nipomnishi. So would this be the day? Carlsen likes to play, you know, these slightly irregular openings, going for, you know, a, a non-standard position. But here, in fact they've transposed into a very regular opening, an exchange Slav, but it was Nipomnishi that has done the exchanging. And here the normal moves are bishop to f5 or a6 and bishop g4. Um, I mean, these moves have been seen a thousand times. But uh, Napo played knight h5, knocking the bishop back. Of course, you can go to g3 or g5, they're not, not very good. Bishop d2 is the best move. And he simply came back, so inviting a repetition with bishop f4, of course, Carlsen doesn't want that, he just played e3. So we've got a curious situation where somehow Carlsen has managed to gain two tempi, but that bishop is locked in behind the pawn on e3. But uh, Nepo just played e6 here, locking in his own bishop, so means that Carlsen is two tempi up, but it's such a symmetrical position, there's, there's not so much going on. Why did he play e6? Well, if you play a move like bishop f5 or bishop g4, then the queen can come out to attack the b7 pawn, and that's already a little bit uncomfortable. So, therefore, e6. So, Carlsen has a couple of extra tempi, but it's very hard to, to use those in such a dry position. Nevertheless, here he goes. He could have just castled and played rook c1, but instead he played e4. So using those extra moves to break open the position. And now we've got another fairly standard position, an isolated queen pawn position. But the bishop is slightly awkwardly placed here. White has to be a little bit careful about the d-pawn. So castles for white. Now it's it's very risky for black to actually take the pawn. Bishop c3 gives black a uh, few problems there. He's way behind in, in development. So Nipomnishi just castled, very prudent. And here, well, normally the queen stands best on e2, but queen c2 again aims to use that lead in development that white has. Obviously, pressure on this diagonal. So this provokes some kind of weakness. So black has to decide, do you play h6 or do you play g6 here? g6 would, of course, allow this bishop to find a good square. So Nipomnishi plays h6. I mean, there are pros and cons to both moves. And the rook came into the middle. Of course, at some moment, this d-pawn is going to need protection. And yeah, here, again, I think... To take is just well, very, very risky, considering that black hasn't completed his development. It's very difficult to complete development. Bishop d7, not possible. And, you know, queen c3, maybe rook e1. I think white has tremendous compensation for the pawn. So, uh, Nepo, after not too much thought, just played bishop d7. Normally, of course, Black wants the bishop on this, whoops, not that diagonal, <laughs> this diagonal. But it's very hard to bring 
the bishop there, of course, b6 impossible because the knight would be on pre. So bishop d7 is not a beautiful move, but black does have to um, develop his queen side, and he hopes later on to bring the bishop to c6. White has to be a bit careful about moves like knight b4, so therefore a3. And rook c8, hassling the queen. This is the disadvantage of having the queen on c2. And then knight c3. Um, certainly the best move. Queen b1 has previously been played before, but after queen b6, this queen is somewhat sidelined. And yeah, the pressure against d4 actually gives black a reasonable game. Knight c3 is a good move because he's looking to cover the d5 square. Now a6, and queen c1, so the queen not best placed on c2, so looking, uh, Carlson is looking to, to regroup, and in the meantime, he's actually threatening, uh, or actually a thunderous sacrifice on h6, so therefore rook e8. Now, but it's possible to take on h6, but white lacks a rook. You, if you could transport the rook over to g3 or h3 then this would be interesting but here the bishop does a tremendous uh, defensive job protecting the king so therefore rook e1 okay normal move rook on the semi-open file bishop f8 so ruling out any sacrifices and perhaps making room for the knight to bounce around here that's possible Bishop f4, so that means it's just allowing the queen to come back to a, a normal position, and the bishop does not stand badly on f4. And here I was sort of half expecting knight e7 to allow this bishop to come to the long diagonal. It's a very standard way of playing this kind of position, actually. But Nepo played b5, just hoping to get some counterplay on the queen side. So queen d2, getting out of the c file, b4, and by playing b4, the knight reaches quite a nice square, looking at the bishop, looking at d5. And yeah, the bishop could drop back to b1, but somehow after this, well, certainly black has sufficient counterplay here. Um, the queen looking down on b2, and you know this is nice and solid as well. Why well, could play like that, but interestingly, Carlson didn't bother to remove the bishop. He simply played knight e5. Um, so after this exchange, well, you know, that knight was potentially troublesome, and the queen is able to switch along the third rank. Um, and and this can set up some, some very nice attacks, actually. So I think this is... Um, quite a, a critical moment in the game. I thought it was very interesting that Nepo, well, didn't think for very long in this position at all. Um, but actually, I think it's a very important moment. So a couple of uh, interesting options for black. One would be to play knight d5. And not to recapture, but to play this. And queen takes, now this is a pawn sacrifice. You allow the bishop to take on h6, but actually, suddenly black's pieces look very healthy. Um, somehow black's pieces have been straightened out. Actually, his king is absolutely fine. The rook is very active. Good compensation for the pawn. Another way is to play bishop b5. Again, just this bishop is on an awkward square. So just get rid of this bishop. Give a pawn. But here it's quite clear that black has reasonable compensation because there are two isolated pawns. This knight is tremendous on d5. You know, it's an absolute rock. Decent compensation. But Nepo played a5. He had another idea in mind. Queen f3 starts to put a little bit of pressure here. And, well, if a4, then I think Carlson's idea would have been bishop g3, just to, to come around here. And there is definite pressure um, on black's position. That's a bit uncomfortable. So Nepo played bishop b4. And here, I think, 
Carlson perhaps underestimated a real shot. He could have played bishop h6. Okay, let's exchange off bishop for knight here, and black takes. And now the point is, after check, if the king goes to f8, then queen f4 is very dangerous indeed. Um, obviously, threats to h6. If the king comes back, then a rook swings over. And, well, that's quite a potent attack. Or if king h7, then you can take on f7. And actually, white is, is doing very well in this position. So that was one opportunity that Carlson missed. Not that rook e3 is a bad move, and in, indeed, we we know that it's really important to, to swing a rook over if possible. And I think round here, Carlsen would have been very happy with his position. Now, Nepo's exchanged here, which you could say helps White. You know, this, this pawn could advance down the board and, and then followed by c5 or maybe d5. This knight is just a monster on e5, a beautiful position. It just has such an influence. So why did Nepo do this? Well, he wants to improve the situation of this bishop. And here I thought Carlsen should just play rook c1, stopping this idea of bishop c2. And I like White's position. He played rook a1. This is also a good move. But it does allow this bishop onto perhaps quite an important diagonal, and that helps with the defence. Nevertheless, Carlsen is still doing very well here. Um, and bishop f5, an incredibly provocative move, and Carlsen was indeed provoked. He advanced the g-pawn, and here I think he could advance again. Why not? Um, and after this, then white's threats are, well... They're, they're building very nicely on the king's side. Um, I think I think this is a very difficult position when when black is is tied um, with with this pin tied down with this pin. You know, queen h4 coming, rook g3, and so on. But instead, Carson very quickly just played c4 again. Not a bad move, but you know, I, I would have expected him to to press on on the king's side. Now. Queen takes d4 is impossible because rook d1, queen goes back, and then bishop h6, and something's hanging here. This is great for white. So knight d7, Nepo trying to exchange off pieces, this tremendous knight. And here, strong move for Carlsen, simply c5. This looks good, and white is definitely better here. The c-pawn is potentially very dangerous. This bishop is a monster, of course. It can sometimes sit on d6. White is doing well. Maybe rook comes over, hits this pawn. Good position for white. Carlson played knight c6. I think he'd anticipated queen b6 and then d5. And certainly, you know, white's initiative is rolling here. Very nice. But instead, after queen f6, it was clear that he was slightly thrown by this move. He took the pawn on a5. I mean, I think he just, Carlsen thought he was now just a pawn up for nothing. Because if queen takes d4, then again this move rook d1 pushing back the queen has to defend the knight. And the knight comes in here and it's coming into d6. Better for white. But here Nepo played knight b6. Carlsen had obviously completely overlooked this move, threatening the c-pawn and, take care, could be threatening this one as well. Carlsen's best here is simply to give up a pawn, coordinate the rooks, give back the extra pawn, and this is equal. This is just an equal position. Instead, he pushed on with c5, and he had completely overlooked that rook takes c5 is possible because of the pin here. Terrible. Absolutely terrible. Now, still possible to try and hold this position. He took queen takes king h2. 
queen takes knight, and here Carlson should take on b6. Black is a pawn up, but I think, you know, it, it, it's an unpleasant defensive task, but white should draw this position. Instead, Carlson looked for more. He played queen takes queen c6, attacking the rook and attacking the knight. So he obviously thought, you know, he can still take here and he's going to be better. Then came queen a4. So yet another move Carlson had overlooked. And that's the end of the game. If queen takes knight, queen takes bishop check, black is a whole piece up. Um, well, th there's nothing here. The queen defends the rook. I mean, this is a kind of move it's very easy to overlook. I mean, this is an a, 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 such a, a multi-purpose move. I mean, it's a beautiful move. But with this move, black retains his extra piece. Carlson found nothing better to exchange. He's a clear piece down, and the knight simply comes back to blockade the pawn on c8. You're going to shut out the bishop. You're going to round up this pawn very easily with the king and rook. And that is the end of the game. Here, Carlson resigned. He was absolutely steaming after the game in, in the... The little interview that he had afterwards, he was his answers were short and um, not very sweet, um, and he stormed off. So, I mean, Magnus missed so many, well, good opportunities, but then um, so many tactical oversights as well at the end. Disastrous game for him. So he is struggling for his form in this tournament. So going into the final round, it means that Jan Nipomnishi has five and a half points. He's in the, in the lead. Caruana only drew so with Nakamura, so he has five. He's in second place. And Maxime Vachilograf has four and a half. Final round pairings, fascinating. Nipomnishi has white against Vachilograf. Caruana has white against Adams. So Caruana, if he beats Adams, could maybe catch... Um, Nepo, but you know that game between Nepo and Vashielagrav, absolutely crucial. So it's going to be it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. So stay tuned, and I'll let you know the final result of the London Chess Classic. Just one game to go. <laughs>